Hello, and welcome back to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Have any of these questions ever crossed in your mind? Why have bird numbers declined so much in recent years? How are rescued raptors trained for educational shows? What's it like starting a nonprofit at a young age? What the heck is falconry actually? And is Harry Potter's owl a good pet in real life? All of these questions have popped into my mind during various musings with myself, and I finally had the chance to ask all of them to this week's rock star guest, Devin Jaffe. Devin is a bird conservationist, the founder of Nature's Educators, a world-class raptor breeder, master falconer, and a musician. I have no idea how she successfully wears so many hats, but let me tell you what, she's absolutely crushing them all. I learned so much from Devin, and I hope you all will too. Be sure to stay tuned until the end of the episode to hear this week's conservation question. All right, everyone, on to my conversation with Devin. Hi, Devin. Thank you so much for coming on Rewildology today. We are going to have a blast because you are such a fun person. Cannot wait to just dive deep into everything you know. Just learned that you're also a musician, so we, we got to get there too. But before we do, you are probably the most unique birder that I know. You are a bird gal, but you do not wear the same normal bird hat as most birders do. So let's dive deep into that. How did you get into birds? What was your journey that led you into what you're currently doing? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so growing up forever, I was super, super into dinosaurs and I wanted to be a paleontologist since probably preschool. So I can tell you everything you didn't want to know about dinosaurs too. That's my, <laughs> my super nerd. So I ended up taking an internship when I was in middle school with a paleontologist that's here in town. And it was fun, but I was expecting like Jurassic Park, you know, because you're a kid and you're all excited. And I, <laughs> I got to go in a couple of digs, which is really neat. Um, I got to dig out some, some actual bones and some footprints and things like that. But um, here in Colorado. The, yep. Yep. Actually right here in Canyon City area. Um, and so uh, it, it wasn't quite what I was expecting because a lot of the time that you're there you're doing work in the lab or you're doing research, which is cool, but I wanted to do more outside stuff. And so the paleontologist was the one that said, you know, you might want to look at working with the dinosaurs of today, which are birds. And so uh, I was a 4-H kid uh, forever and I ended up getting um, uh, into livestock because uh, I showed rabbits and cakes and, and I did the paleontology project through 4-H as well. And then I picked up the wildlife project and did a research project on the prairie falcon and the stellar's jay. And my parents took me to the raptor center in Pueblo to be able to see some of the birds that were there so I could get pictures for my project. And I was like, ooh, this is what I want to do. <laughs> this is so cool. Um, and so when I got into um, high school, then I started doing more research and things about how you could work with birds and it's frustrating because so many times people just tell you you can be a zookeeper. And right. Like, that's it. I'm like, that's definitely not what I want to do. <laughs> um, or you could be a veterinarian. And so when I got into college, my freshman year, um, my mother is a teacher. And there was a individual who had sent an advertisement through the uh, school district emails about how she had just acquired federal licensing to have educational birds and she could bring these birds into classrooms and all this kind of stuff. And so I reached out to her and started an internship through college with her for credit. And then after only a few months, um, she had personal changes. She moved, um, rehomed her birds. And one of the birds went to the Raptor Center in Pueblo. And so I actually shifted my internship over there, but was going to school in Hastings, Nebraska. So during school season, I did my internship through Raptor Recovery Nebraska, which is now Raptor Conservation Alliance. And then when I was home for the summers, I was working for the Bureau of Land Management doing um, range surveys and wildlife studies and things like that. And then also did my internship at the Pueblo Raptor Center. 
And my senior year in college, the director in Nebraska said, you know, why don't you just get your own license? I can help you get your own license. So my senior year in college, I actually got my permits to house raptors and got my first two birds, my red-tailed hawk, who I still have, um, and my great horned owl and started doing programs. So that's it. I have <laughs> so many questions. So the first one, um, I brought it for a second because I just saw that there is a music stand behind Devin. And that's why I was like, oh, yeah. you're a musician. I mean, I can see those right off the bat, you know, having been a musician myself for many years. I was like, I, you're also a musician. So what was that shift, though? So you originally went to school for music, but you shifted majors. Mm -hmm. Why? Why did you decide to go the bird route after all when you were pretty dedicated to music? So, yeah, that's a funny one, actually. So when I went to college, I went into school for biology and music. So I was a double major. And um, sophomore year, I had to take ear training and music theory, and I was terrible at <laughs> both of them. Um, I'm a very good player. I had a scholarship for bassoon um, and everything. And, you know, I still play, I still teach music lessons and all that. And I, I sat down with my woodwinds instructor and I said, here's the deal. Am I actually going to get a job where I need a degree for bassoon performance to teach lessons and to play in orchestras? Or should I switch to biology? And she, <laughs> she was kind of funny because she just like closed the music book and was like, switch to biology. <laughs> So I stayed in music the entire four years. I, I still play, I still teach lessons and I, I stayed in and, and took lessons and gave lessons through the college and everything. The only classes I didn't take were ear training and theory. Cause I was like, I cannot, <laughs> this is not for me. I just want to play and teach other people how to play. And um, so she was like, yeah, you really don't need a degree in music to do either of those things. So concentrate on biology. I was like, <laughs> that is fantastic advice. Oh my gosh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're still playing and you're giving lessons, which obviously is a form of income. And you were able to focus on your biology bird work full time. Okay. Amazing professor. So <laughs> glad she said that. And yes. I mean, someone else might not have said that. They'd be like, oh, what are you talking about? You 100% needed a degree. Um, put that biology stuff aside. So, wow. That's huge exactly. for your <laughs> path. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's fun. I still keep in touch with her. Um, yeah. She, uh, every year I go back to Nebraska and do Raptor presentations and she has now transferred and is teaching um, younger kids. And so I'm actually going to visit her new school in a couple of weeks to teach oh. a class with her. So it's going to be really fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, and that totally just also loving using myself. I'm sure it's a way to just, you know, disconnect and unplug as you are a busy lady. Holy crap. So <laughs> it's nice to have that art form literally to you know, decompress, unwind, read some music. I mean, I always view it as like a form of meditation in a way, you know, it's not actual meditation, but it kind of serves the same purpose for anybody who's artistic and, mus and musically inclined. Um, exactly. but yeah, yeah. So let's get back to birds. So you're, you know, I was like, why don't you just get a permit? I can help you get it. And you have your own license to have your own Raptors. Why did you decide to say yes on that versus being like, you know, Hey, that sounds like a lot of work. I'm just going to go work for another nonprofit or something like that. Why, what was it that triggered you? Yes, I should get my own permits. I should have my own Raptors. What was that thought process for you? Well, that's interesting too, because she, she actually told me she, you know, was planning on retiring at some point and, you know, offered me the position to move into, to start training under her, to take her place. And, you know, I said, you know, it's really cool. I'm very flattered, but I, she runs a lot of um, the rehab stuff and I don't, I don't have interest in that. I think that's a very important thing, but I don't want to do it. Um, I only wanted to do the education and teaching portion. And so I thought, you know, maybe I should just start my own organization and, and see where I can grow. And, you know, she said the same thing. She's like, in your area where you live, nobody else is really doing just that. So you might have a niche there. So mm. that's why. <laughs> nice. And so this is how Nature's Educators came to be. Is that right? Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. Yep. Okay. Well, let's dive deep into nature's educators. Okay. So you're in this um, area in Colorado where there's no one else doing what you're doing. So uh, how did you start? What was like the mission of nature's educators and like what year was this? How long has the nonprofit been around now? So I founded it my senior year in college, which is 2008. And when I tried to move back from Nebraska. Um, I was moving back in with my parents for a while so I could save up money to get my own house. The city that I'm in doesn't allow raptors to be kept in your yard. And so I had to spend six months petitioning the city council and getting a whole bunch of signatures and doing presentations and all this to be able to change um, the code. And I was able to change the code for the wow. city. So now, yeah, so now they allow birds um, here with a license. And so I got the city license and was able to build the enclosures and stuff and, and um, start. So um, I started just with word of mouth, just, you know, Hey, I've got these two birds and come, you know, to your class or your 4-H group or your scout group, whatever, and, and talk about them. And word of mouth was huge. So I started expanding and growing. And, um, you know, during this time I worked for the Bureau of Land Management. And so I worked there four tens, so four days a week. And then the other three days I went and just did as many programs as I could and just tried to build it up, build it up, build it up. And um, yeah, kind of just went from there. In 2010, I had a personal career change because of course I wasn't getting paid through Nature's Ed. Uh, all the money goes back to, you know, care for the animals. And so in 2010, I moved up to the Aurora area got a license there and, and because that city actually does allow it <laughs> without anything too crazy. Got the license there, expanded. And then in 2015, I found a property that was able to be rented out, renovated and rented, which hindsight's 2020, that's a whole different <laughs> story. But Douglas County does not allow what we do and still doesn't. So we had to do an eight month use by special review kind of deal, go present in front of people and so now we, we rent uh, a space there with the use by special review license. Um, and then in 2020, beginning of 2020, luckily before all the craziness started happening, <laughs> my husband and I were like, you know, what? I can't keep driving. I do the bird show at the Royal Gorge Bridge seven days a week, four times a day. And so I couldn't keep driving back and forth <laughs> from Sedalia to Canyon City. And so we bought a house down here again. So kind of like complete circle um, and then moved all the flight show birds and everybody down here. So, oh, it's been a nice process. on your on your property then. So, like na- all the nature's as birds are on your property. Yeah. So the organization has always been housed on my property, you know, and even the the facility that we rented in Sedalia, yeah, um, I lived on. So I always liked that just because, mm. um, you know, it's a it's a security thing. Oh, I can imagine. Has anybody tried to do anything? Has anything happened? Or yeah. Oh my gosh! Uh, do you have stories? Yeah. So people are crazy. Um, we have had people come up to every property that we've been on and they'll try to like look in the enclosures and try to like go in and take pictures and things like that. And now mind you, this is private property. So these people have to drive through these no trespassing signs and all this um, to get it. And, and, you know, when I lived in Aurora, uh, we talked to the city and the city actually let us use a fake address <laughs> so that we could still get mail and things, but it actually went to the city. So yeah, we've had some, some interesting people. And so now where we are down here, we are way far out in the middle of nowhere. So it takes people a, a process to get here. We've got <laughs> gates and cameras and all that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That sounds insane. I can only imagine. Are they just like, what, what's their motives? Why, why are they trying to knock on your door? I have no idea. It's people that they want to come see these birds and we're, we're not open to the public. You know, it's my house. <laughs> and so these people are like, well, I want to come see the birds. I'm like, if you want to go see the birds, whenever you want, go to the zoo. <laughs> this is uh, not <laughs> oh, I see. So they think it's more of like a rescue situation. And like one of the forms of income is by essentially tourism with people coming in. Is that, is that yeah. kind of what well, that, that, but then there are also the people who will try to come in and they want to, you know, we haven't had this, but well, I haven't, I haven't talked to the people who've come and, you know, trust well, fast. That's true. <laughs> you know, the sheriff, like, get out of here. But, um, you know, there are people, including falconers, um, who have had their birds, um, stolen <gasps> right out of their, right out of their yards, because there are people that think that birds shouldn't be in captivity no matter what. And so then they'll just cut them loose. <laughs> it was oh, really sad. Wow. 
God. A few years ago, there's a university that has a Raptor center attached to it. And they had a bald eagle that had um, partial wing amputation and some animal activist people came in and cut the locks and let the bird go. Bird can't fly. And so this poor eagle who'd been at this facility for like 30 something years was killed um, right outside the enclosure door by another wild bird who came down and was like, oh, you're in my territory and, and killed the bird. And so people that, that, you know, think animals, you know, all animals in captivity are abused and there should never be any animals in captivity. They don't stop to think about the consequences of these things that they do where oh, I'm just going to let this one winged bald eagle go free. Well, the bird's going to starve to death or get killed by another bird. And that's exactly what happened. So it's scary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, these birds are everything to you. I mean, the way you talk about them is just like, they're almost like your feather babies. <laughs> they are children. And like when people, you know, get upset or they, you know, they'll say, I don't understand why you have this bird in captivity. I'm like, I don't understand why you have a dog or children. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so let's let's continue on with nature's educators for a while. So what what's like your big mission with with the nonprofit and and what exactly do you all do? Yeah, yeah. So so our, our mission, of course, is education. So we're we're teaching people about these birds, we're teaching about conservation. Growing up, I had um observed wildlife presentations and, and, you know, things like that, where people come in and it's constantly negative where like people suck, the world's falling apart. There's not really anything you can do about it, except turn the water off when you're brushing your teeth, you know, like, yeah, like that. And I was like, God, there has to be a better way. (laughs) And so our big thing, when we do all of our programs is we have people leave with at least three things that they can do personally to help birds in the wild. Um, Because so many times conservation is represented as like, you know, wind turbines are terrible. Well, what's the, what's the typical third grader supposed to do about that? Or power poles have transformers that aren't protected. Well, what's a second grader supposed to do, you know? And so our whole thing is like, well, let's talk about things that everyone, including children can do. Um, So we do a big thing with that. And what we do is we go out to, you know, schools, libraries, nature centers, festivals, events, and we take our animals with us, our, our birds, we have mammals, reptiles, amphibians, everybody. And we go out and teach about, you know, dispelling wise tales. You know, for example, people think that you can't touch a baby bird because the mother bird's going to smell human scent. And like, God, that's, guys, come on, basic biology. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or like, you know, we teach a lot of um, invertebrate programs because there's not a lot of folks that, that work with those for outreach. And, you know, the, the whole, ooh, the most venomous spider in the world is the daddy long legs, but it can't bite you because its fangs are too small. And I'm like, that's not even a spider. So let's start with that. That's another one of those like basic biology facts here. <laughs> so our, our big thing is to dispel wives' tales at the same time as you know, having people understand how to identify these animals and um, how to get along with them in their area and the things that they can do to help them. Wow. So a little bit of everything. <laughs> I love that. That is so powerful. I mean, that's my exact motto as well. Like everything you're saying, I was like, yes, yes, yes. I'm like yes. cheering you on, but over here, because I'm the exact same way. Doom and gloom has gotten us nowhere. Yep. I mean, every, I mean, honestly, like if somebody feels that there's nothing they can do, why would they change? Why would exactly. anybody change? Why yeah. would anybody change? I mean, I mean, all the way from the top, top leaders, all the way down to like, like you said, a second grader. If no mm-hmm. one feels that what they do, their decisions make a difference, then they're not going to change. And yeah. even just like a tiny behavior and, and also celebrating the, like the small wins too. And I think that people overlook that as well. Like if you're not this, 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 and this, and if you don't do all of these things, you're the devil. And it's exactly. just like, yeah. <laughs> fuck you. Like, yeah. I mean, w- we're going to get into it and just about falconry and hunting and stuff like that. But like, from like a diet standpoint, I know a lot of people are really adamant on like diet changes and which I completely understand. But at the same time, like me, I've learned I can't be a vegan. Like I can't mm-hmm. with, with my body type. I literally can't do it. And so every single time someone post very demeaning stuff online. It's like, I feel attacked personally. And that is not how you get somebody to come to your side or even to like 
put that little plant that little seed in their brain that might grow into something, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah, yes. it's very frustrating. And so that's why our big thing is to get out there and show that, you know, there is something that everybody can do and that conservation is not difficult. And it, it shouldn't be that, oh, the end of the world is coming because you drank water out of a plastic water bottle. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, you guys, you got to get people excited about it. And it's always just negative, 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 then everybody's going to be negative. So nobody's going to make a change. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Cause no one's going to feel like they could do a difference anyways. Exactly. So what are some of those tips that you love to share or the ones that you find yourself repeating the most? Yeah. So we have, we have three that we usually say that are easy because anyone can do them. So number one, our big thing is don't use rat poison. That stuff that people set out, you know, mice and rats eat it. And what a lot of people don't realize is on average, it takes rats and mice five days to die after eating that stuff. It's not instant. And so they're now, they've eaten that stuff and it makes them really thirsty. So they go outside to try to find water and they're moving much slower than the healthy mice and rats. And so, for example, an owl who's sitting in a tree hears that mouse and there, you know, there's one mouse that's moving quickly and one that's moving slowly. It's going to catch the slower one, you know, that's less energy. And so then now the, the owl is poisoned. So not using rat poison, another, it's kind of a silly one, but it works. So we see all the time people throwing things like orange peels and banana peels and apple cores and stuff out of car windows on the highway. Because, you know, people have this mindset that, oh, you know, it'll just dissolve. It's compost, you know, the rabbits and squirrels will eat it. Well, that's true. What they've now just done is attracted those rabbits and squirrels to the edge of the highway, which attracts all the predators into the highway as well. And so now we face two or more animals getting hit by a vehicle. So don't put food out. Um, And the other one that is our big push, but we get a lot of pushback on it, is keeping cats indoors. (laughs) This is one of those, like, I've had cats for years. You know, I had a barn cat who I specifically trained to stay in our barn. And I harness trained her so she could walk on a leash. Just like a dog, cats can do that. People have this idea that they, (laughs) exactly, it's not that hard to train. And so I trained my cat. It took me weeks, but I trained my cat to walk from the barn down our barn road up to sit on our patio and back. She never went off of that path. She never killed anything outside the barn. So she stayed in the barn and would catch the mice that that came in, but never anything else. Um, And we were also always outside whenever she was out there. Um, And then we'd have house cats forever, but we have these people who have this mindset that, well, my cat roams the neighborhood, but I know that my cat doesn't kill anything. I'm like, that's such bullshit. I'm sorry. But if your cat's running around through the neighborhood, unless you have a GoPro on it and you're watching it 24 seven, you have absolutely no idea what that animal is doing. And cats are predators. Cats kill thousands and thousands of animals here in the United States every year. We are also very against, or I should say, I am also very against this a uh, program that a lot of rescues are doing where they trap these cats and they bring them in and spay and neuter them and then they release them. So while yes, that prevents the population from spreading, it has still introduced those animals back into the ecosystem for them to continue killing everything. And, and it's so frustrating, but we get a lot of pushback on that you know, from, from people that are quote unquote cat lovers. And I'm like, I'm a cat lover too, but you know, I want to make sure my cats don't ingest poison. I want to make sure they don't get hit by cars. Um, you know, I worked in a vet hospital for a while and, you know, house cats that are allowed to roam free. I mean, their, their lifespan is so, so short (laughs) and people get so upset when their cat gets, gets, you know, killed by somebody's dog or killed by a cat or killed by a great horned owl. And it's like, well, you asked for it. (laughs) Duh. Or in fights with other cats. I, yes. I, mean, I saw that so many times. Yeah. When I was in the vet world as well, like these cats coming in with hellacious bites and, yeah. and nasty bites. Yes. And also too, if they're outside, you don't know when you're going to see your cat necessarily. And mm-hmm. yeah, no, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent as well. Just keeping your cat indoors um, mm-hmm. for that exact same or thing. I mean, those catios that you, have you seen people? Yes. Those? Those are super cool. Like then, you know, if your cat has the, you know, the need to go outside, then at least it can go sit and sit on this catio thing. Those are super cool. There's one down the street from us. I'm like, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> um, but you know, not, you know, don't let them run or run around. I mean, and that's the same. I always tell people it's the same as me letting my dogs run around. 
you guys would be all up in arms over that. So, you know, why are cat people different? I just don't understand that thought process. Yeah. And I mean, the, the literature is out there. How yeah. domestic cats are one of the deadliest predators there is a- across the world. And the mm-hmm. devastation that they've done to birds and small rodents mm-hmm. is astronomical. I mean, it really is to the point where it's an actual conservation concern with yes. all these cats. And I don't, I, I think it's, it's easy to, just like you said, to disconnect us ourselves from that, especially since we love cats. We don't necessarily think about them as that, or maybe, you know, it's super cute or you think it's adorable when it brings back like a mouse because it's the, it's gift to you or something. And uh, just think yeah. of how many other things it's killed and other birds and stuff. And it's just, it's just coming to a point and they're really good at breeding. They're really good at making babies mm-hmm. and it is an issue. I mean, here and, and abroad, I mean, it's really, it's really become a thing. Well, and something that people f- fail to remember, um, is that, you know, when cats are running around outside and they're, and they're killing things like mice and rats and, and even prairie dogs and rabbits, fleas or other parasites get on those cats and they bring them right back into your house. And then, you know, people are exposed to plague and they're exposed to tularemia and they're exposed to hantavirus. <laughs> and it's like, where did this come from? Oh yeah, you have a cat running around outside bringing it right back to you. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also I could definitely say that as well. Like, um, you know, having been in the vet world and having had dogs previously, I mean, you do get, you know, anti flea and tick and all of these uh, anti-parasite stuff, but you don't really see that for, with cats necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, they're warm blooded, fuzzy creatures, just like dogs. Yep. And there's no, a flea doesn't care. It's just like, wow, no. look at that warm body. Let me just hop yeah. on that thing right there, you know? <laughs> and then of course it comes back inside. You pick it up and you love on it. You put your face in its fur because you love your cat. And then now you're exposed to whatever it was just out in. Yep. Yep. Common sense is not common. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I have like a little leash it's because Joplin is our cat and she's harness trained yeah. and um, we have like a little patio and stuff and she is adventurous. So we do have to like keep her on her leash and stuff. So, yeah. but it's nice. I mean, so we both get to enjoy being outside and she, we take her on little walks and she yeah. like, I don't know why, but she loves to eat grass. And so we'll just yeah. go out to like some grassy areas and she just chounce down and <laughs> coughs a little bit and she loves life she's like yeah. the most spoiled thing of all time i did the same thing it was it was fantastic my cat was like no this is great i'll just walk around on a leash that just like a dog <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly i just don't think it's just near as as common practice so maybe people just aren't real or don't even know that you can do that yeah yeah but you definitely can and it's very fun it's yeah. and it's adorable <laughs> no and it's very rewarding you know, I mean, once you, once you get, you're like, I have trained this animal to walk with me right next to me in a safe way for everybody involved. Super cool. Yeah. I mean, even, well, you know, you're in Colorado too, that I mean, there's even been some hikes that I've gone on where people have their cats and stuff. Yeah. So you can definitely do that too. It can be your adventure partner. We haven't quite got to that level with Joplin, mostly because she's pretty young and COVID and like, Things are just weird right now. So <laughs> she's not an adventure adventure kitty yet. She doesn't have an Instagram or anything, but yeah. we'll work on that. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> That's next. Oh, yep, yep. Joplin just roaming nature <laughs> safely on a harness yeah, and a backpack <laughs> where she can't eat anything. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So let's, let's get back to um, nature's educators for a little bit longer. So from from your personal experience, I mean, how has it been like running your own nonprofit? What are some of the highs and lows that have come with that? Ooh, that's a good one. So it's it's been really exhilarating and it's neat to watch, you know, you know, I started this in my parents' backyard with myself and two birds and no money. And now here we are from 2008 to 2021. We do about a thousand outreach events a year. That's insane. Um, <laughs> our organization, yeah, our organization has 32 raptors plus all kinds of other animals. And I actually have the ability to pay myself and pay staff. We offer internships. You know, we've had people from all over the nation come to do internships here. 
So, you know, seeing that and now people know who we are, you know, it's funny because my husband and I can go down, you know, to the brewery or to the winery or whatever. And they're like, you guys are the bird people. <laughs> like, I mean, crazy cat lady, I guess. But, um, you know, that's, that's a neat thing. The lows, though, there are people that will take horrendous advantage of you. You know, I've had people who are like, well, I thought you did all these programs for free. And I'm like, well, we can't. Like, we, we can't do a program for free. That's how we pay to feed our animals, which is horrendously expensive. Um, and so people will get nasty sometimes. We've had other organizations who have come after us. There are other organizations here that I don't know if they're upset or if they're jealous or, or what's going on. I don't want to get too much into that. <laughs> who have written nasty letters to us, who have sent nasty emails. Um, we had one organization who publicly posted a nasty article about us. It, it's just been, yeah, there's a lot of weird, weird competition here. So I think it's, you know, if I were being honest, I think it's a jealousy thing. Um, but you know, it's also frustrating. Sometimes you have volunteers that will start and we are very, very transparent about, you know, read everything on this volunteer application before you start, you know, we only require 12 hours a month. Like that's nothing for a lot of people that you are going to be cleaning poop. You're going to be cutting up meat. You're going to be scrubbing walls. You're going to be pulling weeds. You're going to be cleaning everything. And only a small portion of what you're doing is going out and doing programs. And that's for us as staff too. You know, I'm out there scrubbing, you know, poop off of walls and changing gravel out and cutting astroturf and fixing perches and, and doing all that. We're a very small percentage of what I um, do is, is going out and doing programs. And it's just, you know, based on the, the times that you have. And so then we get a lot of volunteers who will start and like, well, I didn't realize I'd have to be scrubbing shit. And it's like, well, <laughs> if you're in an animal organization. What did you expect? Or we have volunteers who... Oh, it's like a competition where they see this individual handling this bird, but they don't get to handle that bird yet. And, and I have a very, very particular way of training people to make sure that the animal that they're working with is comfortable and to make sure that they're comfortable. And people have this like push, like I have to hurry and get to the people have an obsession with owls. So I have to hurry and get to the owl. I have to hurry and get to the owl or eagles. Like I have to hurry and get to the eagle. And it's like, well, very few people do I ever train on eagles um, simply because that's a whole different world of permits and everything else. But my, you know, when I, when I hold people back from working with the next bird, we have tier systems. So you go through this tier and then this tier and this tier, and it depends on how much time you can put in. If you can only show up twice a month, I can't train you on a lot of animals because the animals have to be able to recognize you and, and understand you and be comfortable with you. And so this is a big issue that we have where people get irritated because they can't handle the specific animal that they wanted when they signed up to volunteer. I'm like, well, that's, we just can't do that. Like you don't go volunteer at the zoo and all, all of a sudden you get to train an elephant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like, come on, you guys. So volunteer drama is a big thing. And it's, it's big in every organization. I've actually reached out to a lot of other Raptor programs, you know, and asked like, how do you guys get over this? And it, it's the same everywhere. It's been the same thing for everyone where there's this, you know, this weird dynamic between certain volunteers and then, you know, there are issues uh, with fundraising, you know, finding funds for a lot of these grants and things. We are competing against the organizations that rescue dogs and cats, which people are way more familiar with and way more likely to support than they are to support a bull snake and a turkey vulture. You know, we also have to compete against funds for the, the groups that are, are caring for tigers and elephants and things like that. And, so it's hard for the reptile programs and the bird programs to find funding um, when we're competing against cute and fuzzy. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a difficult one. And then, if, you know, there's always the, the people that you're, you're just never going to be able to change their mind. And so, you know, I love going out and teaching and, and, you know, nine times out of 10, we have the people that are super, super excited. Everything's amazing at the end. But then you have these people at the end who the only thing they took away from that program is you shouldn't have that bird in captivity. It's like, well, the bird has one wing and is totally fine living here in human care. You know, we don't take birds unless they have adjusted very, very well to life in captivity. Um, and that the bird is comfortable and confident around people enough to be able to go out and do programs. Otherwise, we can't keep them. Um, it's not fair to the animal. It's not fair to us. So that's always the big issue is, is dealing with the, the people that think that they know more than we do. 
about these animals. And I'm like, how many times have you ever gone to, you know, to care for something other than a dog or a cat, um, you know, domesticated animal. And so you get the folks that are, well, I don't think you should have that bird. I'm like, I don't think you should have a social media account. <laughs> <You know? laughs> To be quite honest, <laughs> you know, so there, that's a huge, huge stressor. And we just, you know, even more over the years, it's become more and more intense. So every time we do a program, we have to walk on eggshells around people. There's so many facts and information that I'd love to give, but we have to be careful because you have all these people who just have this idea that they know more than those of us that are the actual experts know. And, and, you know, this happens every day, you know, we call them the, the, the Facebook degrees where these people are like, well, I read an article on the blue whale once. So I clearly am a marine biologist, you know, I'm going to get on and post this stupid stuff. Like, no, you're so wrong. And you're spreading lies. So that goes through with, I think all topics in the world, but that's a huge, huge deal that we, we have to deal with this. These, these people that just don't understand why we have these animals and they don't want to take the time to understand that we are out there trying to help with conservation. They just think that animals shouldn't be in captivity. So that's a big, big one. Well, what, so since you do have a platform right now, I don't know if any of those people are going to listen to this, but if someone is, it's on the fence, what would you like to say to them? Well, so there are a few things. So I want to make sure, you know, people understand like the very first bird that I've acquired, I still have him, Aries, my red-tailed hawk. Someone shot that bird. Um, the red-tailed hawk is nicknamed the chicken hawk. And people have this idea that all they do is come down and kill people's chickens, which could they kill a chicken? Sure. But again, least amount of energy to gain the most amount of energy. This bird's going to go kill the mouse that's coming into the chicken coop to eat the chicken food before it kills a chicken. And so this bird, unfortunately, was shot um, and saw somebody saw him um, kind of hopping through a field um, and jumped out and grabbed him. He's got permanent metal pins now in his wing. Um, so he can't extend that wing. And I feel that it is our responsibility because a human shot this bird, it is our responsibility to care for this bird and, and bring him in. And because this bird adjusted well to life in captivity, which means the bird is not stressed, the bird eats on his own, he bebops around his enclosure, he plays with his enrichment, he gets to look outside in the sun all day, he's got a veterinarian that cares for him, he doesn't have to struggle to find food or, or anything like that. And he lives with other birds. So he, you know, he has social time and everything. So he's, he's got a roommate named Felix and they're best <laughs> buds. They sit next to each other. <laughs> That's and, and so he, he's so cute. And, and so I know that this bird is comfortable living the life that he's living. And, and I want people to understand that it's so important that we give these animals another chance because we're the ones that messed up. Um, I mean, that's a perfect example. Someone shot this bird. It's now our responsibility to care for him and to take him out so people can see, man, this bird's got a permanently pinned, you know, wing. He can't fly anymore because someone didn't understand that this bird is out there hunting mice. And, you know, we, we give the best care that we possibly can to our birds. Um, they get the best diet that they can. They get vitamins. All of our birds have enrichment items that are changed out regularly if they use them or not. Some birds are like, uh, what was that? <laughs> like the, the birds like, woohoo, this is fun. We also, um, some of our birds, like the birds I've got down here, we rotate their enclosures every so often. So they get a different view. Um, they get different roommates to see if they like, the, you know, not all birds are social, but some of them like to hang out with friends. Um, so we, you know, if they want a friend, we put a friend in there. Um, you know, the enclosures are cleaned every single day. They get fresh water. Um, we have veterinarians that can come on site and see these guys they are vaccinated against West Nile. You know, these birds have better care than most humans do. I was going to say, they sound like they got the life. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yep. Um, I mean, and they don't have to, they don't have to work for, for everything where, you know, these folks that think you just shouldn't have that bird in captivity. Well, there's only two other options. You're telling me that I should euthanize this bird or I should cut the bird loose to be killed by another predator out in the wild. What a horrible, horrible death. You know, if this bird can, can adjust well, you know, to captivity to which they do, otherwise we don't keep them or, you know, or we, we send them to display only. Why not grab that, that opportunity to be able to go out and show people that no, it's not okay to shoot raptors. No, it's not okay to, to throw food out of your car window. No, it's not okay to use rat poison. You know, so that's, that's my huge thing is to getting people to understand, just take a second, 
stop and think about these animals in captivity. Now, are all animals in captivity treated as well as ours? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, and there are some huge differences there and, and I've seen it in person, but as far as what I can say, our birds live like Kings and Queens. Quite. <laughs> I mean, like I said, these are, these are literally my children. Like the bird sneezes and I'm in the emergency room because I'm freaking out about something. <laughs> you know and um a lot of folks get upset because they're like well do the birds get to fly in their enclosures and it's always funny because they're always asking it about the bird that has like an amputated wing (laughs) i'm like okay again common sense here the bird can't fly and so for example you know we do have a handful of birds that have wingtip amputations and they've adjusted well to balance um but all those birds have stair steps and ramps and all this kind of stuff so they can beep off around and get up and look out the windows and all of that. Um, you know, and all of our enclosures are designed to U.S. Fish and Wildlife standards for that particular bird species, for that bird's handicap, everything. And sometimes people were like, well, the bird's enclosure is really, really small. And I'm like, okay, well, this is a screech owl that's like four inches tall. I don't think it needs to live in a 50 by 50 enclosure. <laughs> like, yes, they have all that freedom in the wild, but this bird has a crooked wing and can't fly, you know? And so, um, if we put a perch over here on this side of the enclosure, we put a perch over here and the bird can't fly. It's going to constantly be looking at that other perch trying to get over there. And so that's a huge thing that we do is we, we observe how these guys are when they come in, especially our injured birds. We have a lot of fully flighted birds too. Um, but our injured friends that stay with us forever, you know, we'll put them in enclosure with the ramps and the, you know, stair steps and things like that. And just observe to make sure they can get to everywhere in their enclosure without any issues. So I guess, sorry, that was a long story. I love it. No, <laughs> um, it's good. My whole thing coming back is just to take a second and, and think about for one, are you the expert or is the person with the animal, the expert, how much do you know about that animal's care? Most people have absolutely no idea what it takes to care for whatever animal they're complaining about being in captivity and then take time to volunteer with an organization that has that animal. So you actually do get time to understand. Good. Heard it here. <laughs> Devin, the expert telling you what to do. How, how, it just all goes back to education. The more, you know, the more you can actually make smart decisions and well-rounded yes. opinions and, even myself, someone who is in this field, I'm growing every single day and I'm getting new opinions every single day to the point where like, I can't make definitive statements half the time anymore because I'm like, this might change. I mean, there are some things where it's just like, this is just how it is, but there are some things where you just got to keep an open mind. Like, I don't know. I just yes, don't know. Exactly. <laughs> So what would you say in your experience, since you do know these birds so well, what are some of their biggest threats in the wild that you're really trying to help solve through education and, and, and just through your organization? So the biggest threat that we see, most of the birds that we, that, you know, we have a small rehab program too, and I, I trained in wildlife rehab for four years. The biggest threat that we see is vehicle strikes. Um, oh, that's a wow. huge one. And that one can be hard to prevent. Vehicle strikes, that's when we talk about the food thing. Uh, for the smaller birds, it's all cats and dogs. All of it. <laughs> that's almost all of what we see is like a cat attack or a dog attack or something like that. And then, of course, the big one, uh, which is habitat destruction. Um, you know, people are getting upset that these red-tailed hawks or cooper's hawks are in their yard and it's like, well, you built your house in their territory. What, what do you expect? And so a big part of what we teach, we go out and do, we do a backyard animals program. And we teach a lot about how to understand the animals that live in your neighborhood and how to respectfully interact with them. Mm. Oh, but that's a really great program. Just also too, as you know, we are a destination, Colorado, meaning we we're a destination where a lot of people are moving here that don't necessarily Mm -hmm. come from a wild place. Like I grew up in freaking BFE, middle of nowhere, and I've always been very in tune with, you know, wildlife and stuff like that. But not everyone that moving here is. And everyone's like, I just want to be in nature because it's good. We all need to be in nature. We've been so disconnected. And I think a lot of people are, are realizing that we need to reconnect. But 
That means that if you're building your 500,000 plus multi-million dollar home in a mountain lion's territory, in, and if you're going up north in grizzly territory, in moose territory, in wild birds, I, this all comes round to it. They have nowhere else to go. You are putting your house in there and it should be, I mean, I wish that we could almost get like the real estate industry involved and be like, teach your clients that you are moving to this area. You are going to encounter mm -hmm. this wildlife. Educate yourself. They are not the enemy. Yeah. Anything, you're the enemy. And mm -hmm. learn how to live with them. So we have to be like a whole campaign mm -hmm. on that. Learn how to live in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> 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 whole thing <I'm> just <laughs> learn how to live here they're not the enemy if anything you want them there they're gonna you know they're gonna naturally eat your mice they're gonna naturally eat these pests the mosquitoes all the stuff you want them you want them and just Less than me. people people tend to only want the cute and cuddly animals so when something like a snake or uh, a badger ends up in their yard they freak out you know it's this we're never unfortunately we're never going to change that about humans it's the cute cuddly aspect that people love and everything else is a threat when they don't realize that it's the human being the threat <laughs> <laughs> exactly we need them we need them for balance we need them for balance so let, let, let's shift gears yeah. a little bit because there is also a whole sleuth of knowledge that you have and skills that fascinate me because I don't know much about it. And it's falconry. Like you are a master falconer. And most of us have heard that term, but we don't actually know what that means. And, and you have this amazing business called uh, Mile High Falcons. So let's get into that. What is falconry? And what do you do as a falconer? Yay. So falconry is actually the oldest recorded sport in the world. It was first documented like Mesopotamia. So wow, huge, huge big deal. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and like you said, a lot of people have probably heard of it, but don't really understand what it is. And, and I, my favorite <laughs> people always come up and like, are you a falconeer? I was like, well, is that like a mouseketeer? Is that like a Disney thing? <laughs> so <laughs> that's always kind of one of those. Where I'm like, oh, dear Lord, let's start with terminology. <laughs> So falconer and falconry um, is the art or sport, if you will, of hunting quarry um, with trained raptors. It is practiced all over the world, I believe, except Australia. It is not legal in Australia, as far as I'm aware, but it, it's a, a huge way of life for a lot of cultures and, and very important. It's a, a very interesting art or sport. We use the words sometimes interchangeably. And what we do is we are permitted. It's a big, you know, licensing project and program where, you know, instead of going out and shooting game with uh, a bow and arrow or um, a gun, um, we go out and, and hunt game with raptors, um, which is more of a natural way of hunting because that would be happening in the wild anyway. And so it's interesting too, when we're, when we're talking to other hunters, you know, a lot of people are interested in the sport of falconry. And I think they, they don't really quite understand what it is. We see a lot of these YouTube videos and it's funny. The rest of us are probably like these YouTube falconers. So we make so much fun of them, but you know, the, the, the world, you know, of hunting is, is different. I grew up as a hunter. We were in a hunting family. You know, when you go out and you shoot an animal, you have a much, if you're a good hunter, you have a much higher chance of killing quarry with a gun or with a bow than you do with a raptor. For the raptors, we have like a one in 10 chance of, of getting something each time we go out where, you know, a rifle, if you're good, you have a 10 out of 10 and bow and arrow, I think you have a eight or a nine out of 10. I can't remember the numbers, you know, and so we're out there hunting and then our, our birds, you know, we, we run out depending on the species of bird, you, you choose the bird species to hunt, but depending on the quarry that you have and the area that you live in and the skill level that you have. So different states have different regulations. For example, here in Colorado, we have, you know, the apprentice level, the general level, the master class, and then master with eagle, eagle um, which is what I am. And then we have the ability to, to, to utilize different species of raptors and from different sources, depending on what level you are. 
Um, so you move through these different levels and like for here in Colorado, your first level, which is an apprentice, you can hunt with a juvenile red-tailed hawk or American kestrel. And that is it. You, you can work with those two birds. Um, you have to trap them from the wild and train them. The minimum uh, requirement is to hunt or be an apprentice for two years. And then you have to have your sponsor sign off on you so you can move to general class. And in general class, you can have three raptors in your care and it can be a few more species and from different sources. And then master class, you can have five raptors and even more from there. And then master eagle class, we have the ability to hunt with eagles. And so what we do is we, we train our birds to understand that we are not scary because, you know, this, this red-tailed hawk is a predator and this human is a predator. So now we have two predators <laughs> uh, that are working together, which is kind of interesting. And then some of us also use dogs. So now we're introducing a third predator into this group. And we, you know, get this bird to understand that we're not scary. Nothing bad's going to happen. Nothing's going to pop out. Um, so we go through what's called the manning process and um, training, essentially. We get the bird used to us. We get them to start gaining trust and understanding that if they come to our glove, food magically appears, which is so exciting. Um, <laughs> predators. So predators are very, very simple minded. Again, we're going to conserve the, the most amount of energy. And, but we want to gain the most amount to be able to keep conserving energy so we can go out and hunt. And, and humans are the same. Humans are a predator. Whether people like to accept that or not, we are a predator. And so we can, we can understand that. Like, I don't want to go, you know, walking around outside looking for stuff when I can just call Domino's and they can bring it to me, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Chipotle, let's go. <laughs> bring me my <Yeah>. bowl. <laughs> so, exactly. so it's kind of like the same thing. We were like, okay you know, we want to conserve that energy so we can use that energy up later on. And that's what these birds are doing where they're like, oh my gosh, I just jumped to your glove and food is, is here. This is so cool. So we get through this whole process. This can take days. It can take weeks for some birds, depending on the species. It takes months. Um, and then we get to the point where we have them flying free. Uh, when we have them flying free, we, we're training them to allure, which is like a, like a piece of leather or something on a string. We use it as our insurance policy. So the birds come to that lure. They know that there's a huge meal on that lure. So we can slowly move the, the food amount down and down and down um, until they're just coming to the lure with no food on it. And then we get them to the point of killing game. And we want to train these birds to kill the specific game that we want to hunt. Um, when you bring a red-tailed hawk into captivity, naturally, it's already been hunting mice and rats. Well, the whole point of falconry is, is a hunting sport. So we want to eat the prey or the game that that bird catches. I don't want to eat mice and rats. So <laughs> I want to train that bird to hunt. I mean, to each his own, but yeah. um, I want to train that bird to hunt pheasants and quail and ducks and rabbits and hares. And so we work them through that process where if you go out and catch a mouse or a rat, we take it away and we make it kind of a, a negative association. Like you don't get a reward for catching that mouse where, oh, we caught a rabbit. You're going to get a reward, a big reward for catching that rabbit. And then over time, we trade off. And so if my hawk goes down and kills a rabbit, I'm going to go running up. Boom, 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 boom. This is where I get all my exercise through the winter times, running after birds. Um, <laughs> run up to that bird. And I show them, you know, something that's easy. So again, less energy to gain energy. So I'm going to show them like a skinned quail breast or skinned chicken breast, whatever I've got in my vest. And they're like, oh, I'll take that and you can have this rabbit. And so then they let the rabbit go. Um, so I can have it. I take it home and cook it. And then they get the, the treat that I've had in my vest. Um, so falconry is a very interesting sport. It is just not always portrayed accurately, especially on YouTube. We have a lot of people that will come and be like, I'm interested in falconry because I saw such and such video on YouTube. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, well, let's start completely over because it's not accurate in any way shape, or form. And, you know, there are different regulations depending on where you live and specifically the, the countries that you live in. You know, there are these people that want pet owls, which I'm like, oh, my God, you can't do that here. It is illegal. But if you live in certain areas of Europe and Asia, you can have them as a pet. And so what people don't stop to realize is that when you look at these YouTube videos of people petting and loving on owls that are living in their house, they don't look that that YouTube video isn't from North America. It's from Europe or Asia or, or somewhere where you can have them as a pet. And so that's another big battle that legitimate falconers are always having issues with. It's like, no, this bird is not a pet. No, you can't just have a pet owl. <laughs> These are working birds. We have a partnership. 
so yeah, there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of birds that we can hunt with. I've hunted with a lot of different species. There's a lot of different ways that you train them. And, and then of course, you know, the area that you, you live in, like here, you know, I live in Southern Colorado as much as I love deer falcons and I have hunted with deer falcons, um, in the past, I'm probably not going to keep one down here because like today it's 102 degrees, you know, and that's an Arctic circle bird. Um, so I'm going to choose to hunt with uh, a Harris's hawk, which is a desert species. And so we kind of pick and choose, you know, depending on what areas we're in and then what game we have to hunt. Mm, that is so cool. That is so cool. Like I also come from a hunting family as well. And so, and also too, I think it's really interesting to hear that ratio that you talked about, you know, about a one in 10 chance with a raptor. I mean, that's more of a natural predator hunting. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Statistic, like actual, like the success rate. There it is. There it is. Blah, 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 blah. Success rate. <laughs> it is more of a natural success rate. Unlike a 10 out of 10 with someone going out with a rifle. And again, I'm not, I'm not uh, people who do go hunt with a rifle. I'm not, I'm not like downplaying that in any way or saying you're doing something bad. It's just, it's very interesting to hear how this is more of like almost like a natural way of taking animals out of the wild for mm -hmm. consumption. It, it's like a more natural way of doing that. Like I am only going to get of 10 yeah. hunts that I go on. I might get a rabbit one time. And I didn't know mm -hmm. that. Like that was, that's really, really interesting. So how do, how do your birds come to be? Is this like where mile high falcons come in? Well, I guess no, no, no. we're not gonna get that question yet. How did you get into this? <laughs> so you said you come from a hunting family. So like, did you grow up with rifle or bow and then switch to falcons when you got into birds? Or like, how did you get into this form of hunting? So my, my dad growing up was friends with a couple falconers and would go out with them and stuff. We didn't, you know, we just saw pictures and things like that. And um, when I was in high school, um, I got pretty into it when I was doing my 4-H my project with the, with the Prairie Falcon and Stellar's J and and, you know, I knew that it would not be responsible for me to get into the sport until after I'd already graduated from college and have a, you know, house and all. And that's one big thing. Like, I won't sponsor anybody unless they already have all of their own stuff and they have a stable job and they have a vehicle and all that. And, and I, you know, I know some falconers will sponsor their own, you know, whoever they want, but um, we all have different preferences. And, and my deal is you have to prove to me that you have the, the time the finances and the dedication to actually do this sport because me as a sponsor, my job is to make sure the sport continues in a sportsman like mannership as well as, you know, we're caring for the bird. So when I was in college, I talked to a few falconers and went out on a few hunts, um, you know, and I'm already flying education birds. So it wasn't that huge of a switchover. Um, so when I graduated, I got, um, went through the whole sponsorship deal and, and did two years and got into that. So I kind of did it at the same time that I was getting my education license. Mile High Falcons, what I do through that, I'm a licensed falcon propagator, so a breeder through Fish and Wildlife Service. So I have a whole breeding project too, where I can raise certain species of raptors in captivity and then sell them to other falconers or educators or breeders. And how did that start? What, what made you decide instead of just going and training your birds? I mean, because you're an expert trainer. What made you want to start a, a really high-end like breeding program for other people that want to join the sport? Well, I have a prairie falcon. Uh, prairie falcons are kind of my, my thing. I love prairie falcons. They're my favorite. Um, they're notoriously grouchy and I love notoriously grouchy things. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm, like, I'm going to make people love prairie. See, we got a prairie falcon on my shirt and everything. <laughs> love them. Um, <laughs> I'm slightly obsessed. But um, Nike, who's uh, the first prairie falcon that I've had, I, I have her. Um, she's a bird that I used to fly for shows. And one year, she was kind of doing like, jump, 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 and walking around. And she laid an egg. And I was like, holy crap, like this bird just laid an egg. And so I called U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and I said, hey, you know, what would it take for me to get a, a breeding license and I can breed prairie falcons? And they were like, oh, just send in this form. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they have to come out, you know, do an inspection and all that. And I said, I want to transfer this prairie falcon from my license up here, you know, to, to a propagation license. And so 
ended up acquiring birds and, and my deal, you know, I'm just getting started. I've moved and usually when you move, the birds will stop laying. And so since I've moved, um, we did actually have a lot of birds lay this year, but I've only had four chicks hatch this year, which is more than I've ever had, which is exciting. But, you know, my deal is that I want to raise birds that are what we call proven birds. Well, my birds have either been in abatement. So, you know, working at landfills and things to scare the birds away. They've been falconry birds um, or they're show birds. So all the birds that I have in my project have done one of those three things. Um, and have, if you will, proven themselves to be a good, uh, reliable bird. And I hope that those genetics then kind of move down. For example, the Harris hawks that I'm breeding, I have a waiting list right now of 15 people. Wow, <laughs> really? For, yeah, yeah, for their offspring. Mm-hmm. Wow, that is yeah. so exciting. That is so exciting. Oh my gosh. 15 people? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. So, so how does someone get into this? I mean, this I think this also goes in line with this whole YouTube thing as well. So what are you seeing online? What is the actual process to get into falconry? And if someone is thinking about this, how, how do they go about it? So what we see online, there are a couple channels and oh my God, we make seriously we make so much fun of these people. There are these people that are, it's, and it's usually apprentices. So these people who are brand new, don't really know what they're talking about anyway. And they're like, I'm going to post my falconry journey online. And they post all these really stupid videos of them just like holding the bird and kissing the bird and petting the bird and, and all this. And I'm like, well, are you going to show us like training the bird? Are you going to show us how to weigh the bird? Are you going to show what you're cutting up to feed them? Are you going to show the bird actually hunting? Or is this more ooh and ah? Look at me, I'm so cool. I have a bird in my glove. So that's a lot of what we see is this, this, you know, ooh, ah, uh, I'm so awesome. Um, you know, and I post pictures of of my birds. I post pictures of me and my birds, but we're out hunting, you know, and so it's a little different, or I'm out doing a falconry education program. So it's not about let me just pose and take my picture and try to look really cool in some ridiculous outfit, which we see <laughs> all the time. We just make so much fun of. But you know, the re- the the reality is, you know, folks that are interested in this sport. They need to find a falconer in their area. And they need to, you know, make sure they're in an area where it's allowed to. There are some places where it is, like I mentioned earlier, not allowed to keep a raptor in your yard. And there are places here in Colorado that don't allow it. So you need to figure out if you're in a place that's allowed. You need to go out with a, a falconer and see what it is and to understand that this is again hunting. This is we are out there killing things with birds. Um, it's not just watching birds fly around like we do for our bird shows. It's completely different you know, sit down with that falconer and say, Hey, you know, what does this cost? You know, it is a highly, highly expensive sport. Um, all of our equipment is very expensive. The housing is expensive. Feeding the bird is expensive. You know, people that have a a rifle, you know, for out hunting season, when you're done, you just put that rifle in a gun safe and you're done. You know, the rifle doesn't have to be fed or watered or cleaned up after every single day, like the birds do, you know? And so understanding, you know, do you have the time and the space um, to be able to do this. You know, I live out on, on acreage. We've got property, so I don't have to drive anywhere to go hunt my birds. I can literally walk outside, um, which is super cool. So I'm lucky in, in that aspect. You need to be able to find areas to hunt. And then what you have to do is you need to, um, you have to take a test and you can do this in different order. You can find a sponsor to study with, or you can take the test first and there, it doesn't matter which way you go. So some sponsors, myself included, like people to take the test first to see if you've studied and you've, you've read everything that you can, you have to pass with an 80 or better through the state. You have to go to a state office to take the test. And then after that, you can find a sponsor. Um, and, and, you know, people need to understand that folks don't have to sponsor you. They can say no. So not, you know, don't be upset. I've told no less than 60 people. No, I have sponsored four people in my entire Valkyrie career. Wow. They have all these people that come out and then they realize, oh my God, the rabbit is screaming because the hawk is grabbing. I'm like, that's what mother nature is. I hate to, you know, to to show you this, but if you're, if you're squeamish about this, this is not the sport for you. (laughs) Not Um, at all. People that, yeah. Or people that are like, well, I don't really have a backyard. Can you house my bird? I'm like, absolutely not. (laughs) Or folks that are like, oh, I'm kind of in between jobs right now. I'm like, no, absolutely not. Because you have to be able to be financially stable and you have to have the time and and the, and it's just the the reality of it. And so I've taken out so many people on hunts before and and I sponsored for total and, you know, going out, sitting down with that person, understanding what it takes care of, you know, it takes to do the care for this bird and, and for the sport. 
And then, you know, my suggestion is to get involved in a falconry club wherever you live. Um, we have two clubs here in Colorado. I'm the president of the High Plains Falconry Club. So folks can, you know, reach out to me and, and ask about that, you know, and get to know other falconers. And then be polite and, and be humble when you're asking someone to sponsor you. You know, would you be interested in taking on an apprentice? Here, I've already passed my test, right? And I know about the financial and, and time um, restrictions for, for this. I'm dedicated, you know, I'll, I'll drive out and I'll watch you. I'll help you flush game for your bird, you know? So um, that's kind of the process of it. And then once you pass the test, once you have a sponsor, you have to have your muse set up, the enclosure, the aviary that the bird lives in. Um, you have to have all your equipment and everything because then the Colorado Parks and Wildlife comes out and inspects and they'll say yay or nay. Um, or you need to fix this, or you know what, you're not supposed to be doing this in this area. Sorry. Once you get your license, then you need to um, go trap your bird. Uh, juvenile red tail is usually what people get, or castrol, and then start training that bird. Um, you also need to get, you know, your other licenses if you're going to be hunting waterfowl, or if you're going to be hunting cranes, or if you're, or you need a hip number, the habitat impact program, I think is what that stands for. I can never remember. <laughs> um, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of other stuff you have to do. And then you have to maintain all of this stuff too. So my, my suggestion is to avoid YouTube, reach out to an actual falconry club, find someone who will take you on a hunt and, and be understanding when people say no. I had a couple ask me maybe a couple months ago um, if I take them on a hunt. And you know, for one, it's not hunting season. So my birds are all molting right now. They don't want me to touch them right now anyway. And, you know, I said, you know what, I'm not, I don't know who these people are. I don't know. And so I said, you know what, I, I'm not interested in this time. You know, please find somebody else. And I got a nasty email back about, well, you, you guys are looking for members and you're looking for people to join your sport. And you, you know, you're not taking people out on hunt, blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, for one, you reached out to me. And for two, I'm not going out and advertising. Yeah, be a falconer. Come on, join me. Like for the most part, falconry, you know, we have a, a group of us, you know, say my falconry is for me. You know, I go out and I do this sport by myself. I rarely go with anybody else except for I fly Harris Hawks and Harris Hawk people can all hunt together because we have birds, you know, Harris Hawks can hunt together as a group. They do naturally. So we get out, we go out and fly Harris Hawks together, but <laughs> it's, awesome. it's a little different than the rest of us. You know, and the most people, I mean, you're out there by yourself and I don't necessarily want people tagging along and, and slowing me down or, or slowing my birds down. Um, and so it really has to be a special person, but you know, be, when you are asking for these people, you know, just, I want folks to understand, to be humble and, and to be polite because no one has to do this. I mean, it's the same as me asking you, Hey, can I go out and watch you train your dog? Can I go out and watch you walk your cat? You know, you can say no, because that's your personal time. That's your, your personal animal. It's the same for us. So that's my, that's my biggest thing. I've had a lot of rude people afterwards when I say, you know, it's not hunting season right now. I'm so sorry. I can't take anybody out. Me, 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 me. I'm like, shit, now you're never going to find anybody. And what, you know, this is also a very small community. And uh, many times people say, hey, watch out for so-and-so if they reach out to you, because here you go. <laughs> we do that all the time. So yeah, avoid YouTube, actually find a real life falconry club. Wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I would, I would love to experience that one time. That, that'll have to be on my like bucket list things, like just to witness. That just yeah. sounds so cool. It's You've been fun. on many hunts. Yeah. I've been in different capacities and I'm a predator gal. So I'm sure I would just be like fangirling the whole time. Just like, <laughs> well, you definitely have to come down. I mean, you've got all the experience and everything too. You already know. And so you'll, you'll definitely have to come down hunting season for us this September 1st through March 31st. Oh my gosh. Have... Just let me yeah. know when yeah. I'll bring in if Lee can come with me too. That would be awesome. We could just yeah. come watch maybe video. I would love that. I would just love to really? experience that. Yes. Yeah, so just let me know. I would yeah. be more than happy to to see that experience and see you in action and see your oh, we'll make in it action. Happen. We'll okay. Make it. This sounds great. <laughs> awesome. So I think next, I, I would really love to dive into this more too. I've, um, I've had quite a lot of people on talk a lot about, you know, the role of dogs in, in conservation. And we just have gone through like education stuff and then also falconry. But how else are falcons and other raptors used in conservation? That's a great one. So let me step back for one second and talk about DDT. So DDT, I'm sure you're familiar with, I'm sure all the listeners are familiar with it as a pesticide that got into soil, plants, water system, and into prey animals. And 
two raptors were severely, severely affected by it, the peregrine falcon and the bald eagle. And it didn't affect the raptor adults themselves. It affects the female's ability to produce thickened eggshells. So when those birds would lay eggs and they try to incubate the eggs, the eggs would crack. And of course, the babies wouldn't hatch. And the peregrine falcon declined very, very quickly. They used to a program called the Peregrine Fund um, and you know, multiple falconers and everybody within that organization, biologists, conservationists, um, DDT was banned and falcons were removed from the wild, brought into captivity, raised in a safe environment, released back to the wild. So that since 1976, when this, this DDT was banned, I think it was 1976, somewhere around, right around there, the, the peregrine has been removed from the threatened list and the endangered species list. Um, and has been sent, you know, sent back out to the wild. And, and so it's a huge conservation success story for that bird. And it's a prime example of how falconers are helping. These raptors also are helping keep our prey ecosystems in balance and check. The common barn owl, as an adult, can eat up to a thousand mice in a year. Um, wow. It's just, yeah, one bird, one owl. And imagine like a family of those barn owls living in your area. And so, you know, those birds are helping us prevent the spread of hantavirus. You know, they don't get hantavirus, they're a bird. So they, you know, they, they're immune to it. Vultures are a really, really good example of, of a conservation helping uh, raptor. You know, the turkey vultures that we see around here that people call buzzards, and that's one of my pet peeves. A buzzard and a hawk are the same bird. A vulture is a vulture is a vulture is not a buzzard. Ah, that's one of my big ones. Um, but a, the, you know, those turkey vultures, they're the cleanup crew. They're eating dead stuff. But they also help to prevent the spread of disease. And, and a good example of that is tularemia, rabbit fever, which we have here in Colorado, which humans can get. It's zoonotic, so we can get it, but the vulture can't. And so when that vulture comes down and eats a rabbit that has died of tularemia, um, that vulture's stomach acid is so powerful that it kills the virus. So even when that bird goes to the bathroom after eating that rabbit, the virus is dead. So that vulture has now prevented that virus from moving into the rest of the warren, um, from moving into the, the prairie dog coteries from moving into foxes, coyotes, raccoons, and then in turn our dogs and us. And so they are helping prevent um, the spread of, of a lot of diseases too, which is super, super cool. Falconers specifically, I mean, and like you know too, being a hunter, um, we also pay for hunting licenses, which help to pay for trails and, and state parks and things like that. You know, those that hug a hunter and, um, you know, hug a fisherman or whatever those. I'm like, we need to hug a falconer one too, because we're paying also. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I don't, I don't really need people hugging me. Um, <laughs> also, good thought. Not actually. It's right? Yeah, <laughs> actually, you can just like give me a thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, these these birds are, are really really helping with our ecosystem. You know, if we lose these raptors, um, we're going to gain a lot of prey animals very 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 quickly. Um, specifically, mice, rats, prairie dogs, um, things like that. So they're very helpful. Oh, that's awesome. And also too. Aren't falcons used quite often on as like a form of a uh, pesticide and stuff on some like organic yeah. farms and stuff? Like, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of that. <laughs> oh, you do that too? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I would love if you could briefly describe what that is. Yeah. 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 So I also work for a company called Wings Over Colorado, which is the only falconry based bird abatement program in the state. And what we do is we have trained hawks and falcons that we take to landfills, you know, to, to farms, to airports, things like that. And we fly our birds around. And, and the difference between the abatement birds and the falconry birds, our abatement birds are not trained to kill anything. They are literally just trained to make big circles or to fly from that point to that point to this point back to us over and over and over. You know, so for example, I've got a, I've got a hybrid falcon, a prairie peregrine hybrid that I take out to landfills and I let her go and she flies up and she flies in big circles above me. And while she's making these circles, she's scaring away starlings and the seagulls who are coming in and they're, they're taking trash. And what's happening is these birds are eating the trash, which isn't that big of a deal, but they carry their food. And so these seagulls, for example, will get this trash. And they'll put it in their beak and then they'll carry it out of the landfill. And then sometimes they'll drop it. And so we don't want trash, you know, being removed from the, from the landfill. And so, you know, this bird, her name's Layla. Layla will come out and she'll circle around, circle around, a couple big circles. And all the seagulls are like, holy shit, a falcon. And they take <laughs> off. <laughs> and then they'll leave for the rest of the day, sometimes two days in a row. 
because they're like, man, you don't want to come over there. That, that falcon is over there. We got to stay away. Um, and then she comes back down and she, she didn't kill any of those birds. All she did was scare them away, which is what abatement is, is, is scaring or baiting something away from an area. Yeah. So that's another thing that we can do. And then there's no poison involved. There's no, you know, any, any of that kind of stuff involved, which is super cool. That is so cool. That is so cool. I just love how we're getting so creative in the conservation yeah. world nowadays. Like, like I said, you know, going back to like the dogs, you know, like anti-poaching dogs have had someone on about that, like scat detection dogs, like all these different conservation programs. And, and also too, now using falcons, it's the same thing. And there's significantly yeah. less invasive. How else are you going to find stuff or how else are you going to scare with things? You're going to right. scare it, possibly hurt it. Some other things, you know, how else do you, you know, uh, present absence study, you flip over rocks, that's devastating habitat, mm -hmm. or like something can smell it out, you know, like it's, it's just using these tools, these partners, essentially, these conservation partners, um, to help with whatever it is we're studying. I mean, like, that's the yeah. cut. We don't want trash everywhere, but we also don't want to hurt these animals. So mm -hmm. let's just scare it. And I'm yeah. sure she loves it. I mean, Layla's probably oh, yeah. flying free and she probably gets yeah. lots of tasty food. She's like, this is the freaking jam. I don't, yes. even, I don't have to hunt one of those birds and kill no. it and all the work that's involved with that. I just get to yeah. like, woo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is wonderful. So I love, I'd love to always, um, now that we've chatted for a while and have gone so much in your story, which has been so fun. L let's, let's switch back to you. What do you think is your like ultimate goal? When do you think you'll have reached success for whatever that means to you? That's a tough one because you know, my ultimate success, so I, have, I have different goals in my life. My um, one goal um, was to become a master falconer with Eagle class. And so I have that. I actually have my golden eagle. I just got her a little over a month ago. I'm very excited. You know, so I, I you know, with, with falconry, your goal should always be moving. It should always be moving forward. And, and my goal is to always just be better, be better, be better, be better. And, and you know, talk to others and learn like, you know, how, how can I, um, train this bird better? How can I make this hunting experience better? How can I catch this specific kind of quarry? So that should always be moving forward and, and always expanding, at least for me, for, for my propagation projects, I always want to be able to, to produce birds that people are excited to acquire and be like, oh my gosh, you know what? I really want one of Devon's birds because I know that those birds are phenomenal. So I, I want to get my name known that, you know, oh, Devon's got those really cool Harris Hawks or Devon's got those incredible prairie falcons and, and those amazing Barbary falcons. So, you know, I want to get to there with that and always be expanding that, be able to grow. And with the education world, this is kind of the sad um, reality of doing conservation education. We will never be able to reach our goal. Um, and the goal, of course, is to conserve all you know wild places and all wildlife and that will never happen and I, I hate to make it sound negative but that's that's the reality you know of the world that we're in now it's, it's for all of us are, are constantly climbing you know this hill where the rocks are always just constantly sliding and so you're always staying right about in the middle you will never ever reach the top you'll hopefully never go back down to the bottom but you're never going to reach the top and that and that's just the you know the sad reality so my goal with that is to be happy, which, which I am be happy with the people that we can reach and, um, the programs that we can push forward and in, in, in hopes that we, you know, educate the one out of 15 people of like, Oh yeah, I'm not going to spit my gum out on the sidewalk anymore. Cause songbirds might come down and eat it and, and get sick and die. You know, so as long as we hit that one person, that's fantastic. And so, you know, being, uh, you know, understanding it. And I, I push all wildlife and conservation educators to understand this, that, You've got to be happy with doing what you can with what you've got. And we have this world of people who no one's ever going to, you know, stop using um, plastic bottles, you know, or no one's ever going to just stop you know, throwing trash. We have these people that just, and, and, or people that are disconnected and they don't understand, like these things are actually happening. So the goal with that is to constantly keep you know, at least sliding in the same spot on that mountain that you're trying to get up and with the understanding that you might not ever actually fix all the problems in the world. And we can't, we can't at this point, it's too far gone, but 
you know, keep getting people excited to try. So that's, that's the mad reality of, of wildlife and conservation education. So, so. You there. <laughs> yeah, you get- you there. <laughs> I so feel you. I so feel you. It's like this constant battle. Like, do I just drink my sorrows away <laughs> or do I stay sober and do something about it? I mean, it really is. It's like, yeah. Do I fold in the towel? But it's like, but if I do, then why would anybody else want to change? Why would anybody else want to follow along? Why would anybody else put in the effort, would volunteer with an organization like yours to go to an event, to educate people, to learn how to handle these birds properly, to give people an amazing experience? Like, oh, if we're not going to do it, then no one else will. So. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. You got to be happy with what you're doing and where you are and, you know, always keep pushing forward. But with that understanding that you might never reach the top. Mm. So. That's great. I think this ties so well with my next question and because you've, you just gave so much, but if you had any advice, cause you have so much amazing experience that you have, if there's anybody listening and there's one piece of advice that you would love to give them, what is the big takeaway that you would like to share? Oh man, there's so many things <laughs> <laughs> or multiple. You don't have to say just one, whatever you want to say. So, you know, I think in the in the business aspect world, you know, keep pushing toward that goal that you want because you can hit it. You know, you can get there. I mean, I, I started a, a highly successful organization when I was 21, you know, and I had a lot of pushback of people that are like, oh, she's just a kid. She's just a kid. She doesn't know what she's talking about. And they come on, I'm like, oh, I guess my so. job, bitches, come on. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> pushing forward and, and, you know, being a professional. So in the business world, that's kind of my, my deal that I tell people, just keep pushing forward and don't listen to what other people say. Um, but you also have to have the passion and the drive to get anywhere. Don't rely on other people to do things for you. If you want it done right, you're going to do it yourself, which is sad, but true. <laughs> um, in, the, in the animal world, I mean, my big takeaway from this for folks would be, you know, take some time to, to look around um, at the area that you live in and, and the, the habitats and the animals that are there. And what are some things that you personally can do to change and, and to help your neighbors to change and help your friends and family change? Um, so just take some time and, and process that. That's a, that's a big one for everybody to think about. Mm. So. That is so good. So good. <laughs> And you're just, oh my God, you're such a fun person and you have these amazing organizations. So how can anybody listening connect with you? What is the best way? Oh yeah, good one. So our, our organization, Nature's Educators, is just natureseducators.org. Um, we have our information on there. We have Facebook page, all that. I have um, milehighfalcons.com and then highplainsfalconers.com. People can reach out to me. My email address um, is devin, D-E-V-I-N, dot j at nature's educators.org. Anybody is welcome to reach out and ask questions about wildlife or about our programs, you know, and we operate a lot of our, our program fees, but also donations, you know, so folks listening, if, if, you know, they can't come out and volunteer or anything like that, but they want to help support our efforts, those donations go back to help feed our animals that are out there working really hard to continue um, conservation efforts. So that'd be a huge one. We're always looking for, for donations and, and sponsors and um, programs book a program with us you know we'd love to come and talk about all the fun creatures <laughs> oh that's so cool and is there like a calendar or um yeah. anywhere to know where a show or presentation is going to be at yeah yeah so we list um I'm, I'm busy so I don't I'm not always really good at putting the calendar updates online but we do have an event calendar on our website um and then for our big public events and things um we post those on our Facebook page okay so we'll have those on there too. That's good to know. That's good to know. So if anybody's in wherever in Colorado or in Denver, I know that your your team has been at multiple events that, that I've been at, which is so fun. I think just that Rhino Week, um, yeah. somebody was there at, at the Ironton Distillery. I was actually there repping the podcast. It was like my first oh, yeah. time like an, in, like an in-person event. It was so cool. I mean, there weren't many people there, but I was really excited. So. Yeah. <laughs> We do stuff like that all the time. Like last night, we just had, um, we call it wine and wings. We did a fundraiser at the Holy Cross Abbey winery out here and, and brought our birds out and did a, a program and people were super supportive that the Abbey is donating um, some of the proceeds from last night. Um, the Florence Brewery here is super, super supportive. We do fundraisers with them all the time. Wow. Um, and then we have our big annual fundraiser coming up. 
in the birds of soiree, uh, birds of prey soiree this year is called feathers of fury. So we have a different theme every year. So this year's theme is post-apocalyptic because last year sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's uh, October 2nd from 2 to 9 p.m. It's free free admission, but there's stuff there for purchase, food and drinks and, and our silent auction, all that. And it'll be down here at our brand new public nature center in Lawrence. Wow. So for information on that, we have our, our website, um, naturetseducators.org. They can look at the nature center and the events and all that on there too. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'll definitely make sure we blast that out. Um, cause luckily this is going to go out before that. So yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll totally pump that up. This sounds amazing. Oh my gosh. Um, sounds like, yeah, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Is there any question that I didn't ask? Is there any last thing that you really wanted to make sure that was shared that we just somehow didn't get to? No, I think this is so good. This is cool. We covered like literally all aspects of everything that I've got going on. <laughs> so I love it. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me too. I really appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Devin. This has been so much fun and I cannot yeah. wait to get your story out there. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> wow. We hit so many various points in that conversation, right? So for this week's question, I would love to ask you all this. For the bird life in your area, what is the biggest issue they are facing? What work is being done to conserve them? Do any species of raptors live near you? And if so, how do you feel about it? Send me a DM on Instagram with your answer at Rewildology or post your response in the Rewildologist Facebook group. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>